from Lagos, the nation's commercial capital. This is the News at 10. Live from Channels Television. Reporting tonight, Amarachi Ubani. Tonight, major victory for women as Abuja court orders federal government to implement 35% affirmative action on women participation in government. Ahead of the PDP neck decision on zoning, presidential aspirants continue to make overtures to party members on their candidacy. An Amber State government moves to ensure peace in the state, sets up Truth, Justice and Peace Committee, headed by a former chairman of National Human Rights Commission, Professor Chidi Odinkalu. And in international news from London, thousands of Ukrainians are fleeing the Donbass region as Russia shifts its focus to the east. On business news tonight, International Energy Agency set to release 120 million barrels of oil to ease global energy price. On sports news tonight, Real Madrid beat reigning champions Chelsea 3-1 at Stamford Bridge in the UEFA Champions League quarter-final first leg. And from Abuja, President Buhari gives assent to Executive Order 11 to bridge the gap from public maintenance buildings nationwide, orders MDS to set up maintenance departments. A sweet victory for Nigerian women, and you may not be wrong, as a federal high court in Abuja has ordered the federal government to implement the 35% affirmative action for appointee political positions. Delivering the judgment, Justice Donato Okorowo held that the government had the obligation to implement the 35% affirmative action, accusing past governments of acting in breach of international treaties on women participation in government. He agreed with the women that the lopsided appointments by the government is unlawful and an arbitrary violation of the National Gender Policy 2006. For several days, Women occupied the gate leading to the National Assembly, protesting the rejection of the five gender bills in the Constitution Amendment process. But what the women did not get from lawmakers, they have secured from the court, following the judgment of the Federal High Court ordering the federal government to implement the 35% affirmative action. The women groups had approached the court to seek the enforcement of the 35% affirmative action in appointive positions, including ministerial appointments. In his judgment, Justice Donatus Okorowu held that the national gender policy is not merely a policy statement, but one that must be backed with requisite action on the part of government. He says the 35% affirmative action which entails appointive positions for women to ensure inclusivity, must not be merely on paper, as Nigeria is a signatory to international treaties, particularly on those entrenching the rights of women. The judge further dismisses the preliminary objection of the federal government that the women had no local standi to sue, among others. The court agreed with us that over the years, the Nigerian state has been violating the rights of women as pertains to participation in governance. That subsequent or several governments over the years has been marginalizing women in their own country. And the court condemned this act and held that the right of Nigerian women to freedom from discrimination must be recognized and enforced by all authorities and persons in Nigeria. For us, it is victory. And for the government, we know that they will acknowledge this and do the needful in terms of ensuring that we have a balanced system of um, governance that will bring about fast development for the country and that would address all other issues affecting the country. By this judgment, all eyes are now focused on the federal government to obey court orders by implementing the 35% affirmative action. 
Staying with the Federal High Court in Abuja, and for a second time, Justice Taiwo Taiwo has shifted judgments on a suit by the People's Democratic Party against the defection of Governor Ben Ayade of Cross River State and his deputy, Professor Ivara Esu, to the All Progressives Congress. The court fixed tomorrow, April 7th, for judgment after counsel to the PDP, Emmanuel Okala, and counsel to Governor Ayade, Mike Ozekome, addressed the court on the judgment of the Inugu Division of the Court of Appeal on the defection of the governor of Ebony State, David Umahi. Addressing the court, Mr. Okala insisted that the subject matter, including issues raised for determination and the interpretation of certain provisions of the Constitution in the cases of Mr. Omahi and Ayade, were completely different. On his part, Mr. Zekobe told the court that the case decided at the Court of Appeal in Ugu Division is same with the instant case at the Federal High Court of Abuja. Noting that the trial court is bound by law to follow the precedents set by the appellate court in Enugu, amongst others. Staying with the judiciary, the Lagos State Government has asked for an out-of-court settlement with a retired judge of the State High Court, Justice Babajide Candid Johnson, on the payment of his pension, gratuity and other entitlements a year after his retirement. The government, through its counsel, Saheed Quadri, has asked Justice Maureen Esoe of the National Industrial Court, Lagos, to grant an adjournment for four weeks to enable parties in the matter discuss. Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Yemi Candid Johnson, who presented the retired judge, did not oppose the re request for an adjournment, but asked the state government to withdraw its preliminary objection to the suit to demonstrate that the request for settlement was done in good faith. The counsel to the state government, however, opposed the request, saying that he is optimistic about the settlement talks. Justice Esoe has adjourned till May 9th for a report of settlement. We're in the National Assembly now, where the House of Representatives mandated its Committee on Police Affairs to investigate an alleged invasion of the Federal High Court sitting in Uyo, Akwaibom State, by personnel of the Nigeria Police on Wednesday, February 16, 2022. During deliberations on a motion by Representative Sergio Sogun, the lawmakers expressed concern that a, during the alleged invasion, the defendant, who is a police officer accused of human trafficking, was taken away by the personnel. Our correspondent, Terry Kumi, has details of today's plenary, which also witnessed maldrama. It's the second plenary session of the week in the House of Representatives. An easygoing session suddenly takes a different turn when the deputy speaker skips the motion of a lawmaker for noise making. Mr. Speaker, we can't let us talk well, here now. If you want to dramatize it, I will help you. No, there's no drama. I don't understand. It's just tragic. You have the authority to say I will not take it. But what I say, what is fair is fair. My motion is listed. And I am here to take it. If you are saying Honorable Shaka is traveling, you want to take Honorable it, that's fine. Judges, but to say I am talking on the floor of the house. Honorable I'm judges, judges, you please take your seat. Okay, Mr. Speaker, I'm sorry. <laughs> Me. I'm sorry. They sorry. His apology is unsatisfactory to the leader of the house as he pushes for disciplinary action. This is it a jungle. This is an institution that must be respected by us who are members of this house. So mere sorry cannot suffice. How can you shout at the speaker sitting with the mayor's placed chief whip? You have to rise here, give us an order that will invoke disciplinary measure on this honorable member. It's not that I didn't want you to take the motion. But I just wanted but to make a point is, sir, is it proper so that he should you understand. And each time I, I want to call his attention and the attention of the house, our behavior does not portray us as good legislators. Working on the gangway, making noise. Honorable Sergio Sogun is eventually allowed to present his motion. The motion alleges that the police invaded a federal high court sitting in New York, Waibom State, and took away one police officer standing trial. The invasion of the court by personnel of the Nigeria police force is an attempt to shield their colleague from justice and continue to perpetuate the commission of the offense of trafficking in person. The House resolves, one, urge the Inspector General of Police to immediately produce the fleeing police officer and hand her over to a National Agency of Prohibition of Trafficking in Persons, NAPTIP, for prosecution. The motion is adopted and the House moves to consider another motion on the needs to protect telephone subscribers from breach of privacy, fraud and loss of money. Many Nigerians are falling victim 
to illegal and unauthorized deduction of funds from their bank accounts because their financial institutions keep sending their bank account transaction details into their Itato phone numbers, which have been reassigned to new subscribers. And like the Senate, the lower chamber extends the implementation of the 2021 budget till May 31, 2022. Terry Ikumi, Channels Television News. Politics now, which is seeing the actors consulting various stakeholders ahead of the 2023 electoral contest with Governor Minu Tambawa of Sokoto State saying the People's Democratic Party has what it takes to reposition the country. Governor Tambawa was speaking during a meeting with the party's National Assembly caucus in Abuja, but he also spoke about his readiness to lead as president. Governor Amino Tambua of Sokoto arrives at the home of the Senate Minority Leader as part of his consultation in actualizing his aspiration of becoming the candidate of the People's Democratic Party. The governor is meeting with the Senate caucus of the party as he attempts to secure their support for his presidential ambition. My record are there. My trajectory is clear and is very well known to you when I served in the federal system as speaker of this country. I served for 12 years unbroken, first term, second term and third term in the House of Representatives. And my contributions are very clear. And I believe in this country and we have all it takes to do it. Appreciating him as one of their own, the lawmakers have a suggestion on what they consider the best approach for the party to select the best candidate for the 2023 presidential election. Why don't they have a small group that can identify without bias from this list a number of people, maybe two or three, that will believe they can deliver to this country. And the Abu can also be happy and Africa will be happy. And then so that even if we get to the convention and we elect any of them, we'll be satisfied. So I suggest that as chairman of the governor's forum, that we'll be able to help us to push this process so that we don't go and have a rancorous convention, which sometimes people disagree, and then it affects our performance ultimately. Governor Tambuwa's delegation also stopped at the home of the minority leader in the House of Representatives, Mr. Undudi Ilumelu, where the lawmakers offer an advice on the unity of the party. Sometimes we see and watch unguided entrances from some persons on telly who are the same PDP members trying to run down their fellow members of PDP. I don't think that is the way to go. The way to go is for us to be united and have a common focus and that focus is to take PDAPC out of power. The governor will be hoping that when the party finally holds its presidential primary on May the 28th, 2022, these consultations will be to his benefit. In the meantime, River State Governor Nyesu Mwike and four northern presidential aspirants of the People's Democratic Party have agreed to put the interests of the PDP above their personal interests in their quest to clinch their party's presidential tickets. The other four aspirants are the former president of the Senate, Okola Saraki, renowned economist Mohamed Hayatuddin, Governor Aminu Tamwal of Sokoto State, and Bala Mohamed of Bochi State. The four northern aspirants continued their nationwide consultations today with a visit to Governor Wike at Government House, Port Harcourt, River State. After the meeting, both Dr. Saraki and Governor Wike gave the assurance that they will work as a team to win the elections in 2023. We're here to have a discussion. We just finished talking about how the best way for us to unite a party to bring unity among all those who are aspiring to lead this country under the PDP. We all realize the importance of this, as it, uh, that PDP is the only option really to really direct this country in the right direction and bring progress and provide a better future for our people. And we've been to some of the other states today. We're here with, with Governor Rivers, a key stakeholder of this party, to discuss frankly. He's given us his views. And we're taking some suggestions that we'll continue to work, work with as we move away from here. But the key thing is unity. The key thing is to put the country forward 
put the country first and put the party first. Our interest is the unity of the party. Our interest is to make Nigeria happy by making sure by 2023 PDP takes over the reins of uh, government because Nigerians are patiently waiting. And I can assure you that we're going to work as a team to make Nigerians happy. In part two after the break, President Mahmoud Buhari gives a sent Executive Order 11 to bridge the gap on public buildings maintenance nationwide, orders MDAs to set up maintenance departments. That's in a moment. Enjoy this again. Welcome back. If you just joined us, you're watching the News at 10 live on Channels Television Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Victory for Women as Abuja Court orders federal government to implement 35% affirmative action on women participation in government. Ahead of the PDP neck decision on zoning, presidential aspirants continue to make overtures to party members on their candidacy. Governors Tambawal, Wike and Dr. Saraki all had a busy day. A number of state governments moves to ensure peace in the state, sets up Truth, Justice and Peace Committee, headed by former chairman of National Human Rights Commission, Professor Chidi Odinkalu. And thousands of Ukrainians flee the Donbass region as Russia shifts its focus to the east. More political players have continued to validate their interest to contest the nation's top job in 2023. One of the latest to do so is former Ikiti State Governor, Mr. Ayodili Fayoshi, who has picked the presidential nomination forms on the platform of the People's Democratic Party, the PDP. He says he is equal to the task of leading the country. I am in the contest because we need men of honor that can turn around our country. Considering the opportunity given to me as a two-term governor of Ikiti State that has defeated two incumbents at two different attempts, and with a very lean, small resources, I believe with what, what I've done and the relevance in my zone and beyond, if given opportunity to serve this country, I will make a huge difference. And I want to believe that Nigerians by themselves will recall all I said in 2015 about the present administration and the leadership of the administration. And what has turned out to be, I was like uh, the prophet that was not announced. All I said there and then by this administration, by the presidential aspirant or candidate at the time, Nigerians took me as if I was joking that they will never impact Nigeria positively. Today it has come to pass. You've seen the, the breakdown of law and order. You've seen the insecurity. You've seen the financial issues. You've seen the situation. The economy is down. Everything is down in our country. People can't, people can't even wait for them to be exited. So I stand there to say, you can send me. And if you send me, I will do the need for more on the quest for the presidency. This time, a former chief judge of Anambra State, Professor Peter Omiade, believes only good leadership can bring about the much-needed change in Nigeria. And he's prepared to give the country that quality leadership. Professor Omiade was speaking in Abuja shortly after picking up his presidential nomination form on the platform of the All Progressives Brand Alliance. Abga, in their own time, have always had presidential uh, uh, candidates. I'm an aspirant today, and uh, it is the thinking in Abga that in 2023 that uh, we will have a presidential candidate. And in that endeavor, we will strive to change the narrative by bringing forth 
what has been absent, which is leadership, because in Abga we believe that it's only good leadership that can provide change. I personally am stepping out as a champion of rule of law, separation of powers, and due process, which I hope if I have the opportunity to administer Nigeria, which I will do firmly and fairly, will engender security for life and property, economic revitalization, and prosperity. Meanwhile, the All Progressives Congress, the APC, is explaining that the dates for the party's primaries are still under consideration. Addressing journalists after a meeting of the National Working Committee in Abuja, the National Publicity Secretary of the party, Mr. Felix Moka, explained that the committee discussed the dates but is yet to take a decision on the issue. The NWC of the All Progressives Congress met and we just rose from uh, that meeting. Uh, amongst other topics covered uh, was, as you probably expected, uh, we discussed the, the program uh, for our party's primaries, looking at the schedule of activities uh, that is to come. Uh, but, you know, I am not able to give you a rundown of the details of that uh, schedule because you know that is still in discussion we are yet to conclude we have not put out any information uh, into the public space about the schedule for our primaries but what I'm confirming to you is that we had that discussion and that discussion is still in progress and as soon as the details are concluded and a decision is made you know you'll be the first to see or hear about it well, it's not about politics in a number of states where the administration of Governor Chukuma Soludo is taking measures to tackle insecurity there. The state government has announced a 15-member Truth, Justice and Peace Committee that will help restore peace in the state. Leading the committee is a former chairman of the National Human Rights Commission, Professor Chidi Odenkalu. The committee has given six months to conclude its work. I'm going to toss it over now to Maupe Ogun Yusuf in Abuja for more on the news at 10. Hi, Maupe. Great to see you, as always. Hello, Amarachi. Certainly good to see you as well. The country could be getting, uh, well, public buildings in the country could be getting a new lease of life as the president has given assent to Executive Order 11 on public buildings maintenance across the country. The signing of the document preceded the weekly Federal Executive Council meeting at the council chambers of the State House here in Abuja. Speaking shortly before appending his signature, President Muhammad Buhari directed all ministries, departments and agencies to set up maintenance departments in line with the provisions of the new executive order. Our State House correspondent Kayla Megua reports. The weekly Federal Executive Council meeting started with President Muhammad Buhari signing the Executive Order 11, a national public building maintenance policy. According to the president, maintenance of assets is more than a culture. Maintenance of assets is more than a culture. It is an economy from which many can prosper, and we must nurture and water that economy by policy and actions that create opportunities and inclusion for our people. After the meeting, which lasted almost four hours, State House correspondents are briefed on the memos presented and approvals granted by Council. Beginning with the Ministry of Works, who got approval for 3.1 billion naira for the rehabilitation of the Kefi Nasrawa Toto Road, he breaks down the benefits of Executive Order 11 on the Nigerian people. Because we have awarded a maintenance contract after rehabilitation for cleaning, sweeping, security, and horticulture, and all of that, 40 new people who had no work before 
are now employed by each facility management. 40, a minimum of 40 in each of those secretariats. Air terminals in Abuja and Port Harcourt are to be maintained with 5.65 billion naira for three years. L3 X-ray machine parts are to be procured at 469.6 million naira. And clinics are to be constructed for the airports in Abuja, Kano and Lagos. And efficient manner. The Minister of Information and Culture briefs on the memo from the Ministry of Education, stating the council has granted licenses to 12 proposed private universities, which he says will be mentored by already existing universities in their various locations. He also briefs on the government's response to insecurity, especially in Kaduna State, and calls for support from all Nigerians as the government addresses the situation. What was not reported was the very timely and efficient manner it was repelled and the huge casualties suffered by the bandits terrorists the terrorists the oxygen they need is what is being provided daily today which is uh, they, they, they want to occupy the front page of every paper in a matter of time, we will overcome the ter terrorists, the bandits and, and, and criminals all around. But far from being you know, overwhelmed, I think we are in, we are in control and we are in charge of the matter. Thank you very much. We are not overwhelmed. That's the message from the Nigerian government to the Nigerian people as regards insecurity following the attacks in Berninguari a few days ago. They're saying that they do not necessarily report every single success that has been achieved by the Nigerian military, but they are calling on the media to support the government to ensure that these bandits or terrorist organizations do not get the fuel they need from the front pages of newspapers. And he's saying we are on top of the situation. From the State House in Abuja, Kayla Megua, Channels Television News. Still ahead on the news at 10, International Energy Agency set to release 120 million barrels of oil to ease global energy price. That's on business news. Do join us again. Welcome back to the news at 10. I'll bring you some update on the train attack which occurred last week. The managing director of the Bank of Agriculture, Mr. Alwan Ali Hassan, has regained his freedom from the terrorists who attacked the Kaduna bound train and kidnapped some of the passengers. Police authorities are yet to confirm his release, but a top government official told Channel's television that the BOA MD was freed yesterday afternoon after spending a week in the hands of his abductors. Upon his release, he was immediately taken to the hospital in Kaduna State for medical treatment. But the source did not state if any ransom was paid to the terrorists before he was released. The BOA MD and others were abducted last Monday, March the 28th, by terrorists who attacked the train carrying 362 passengers. Eight people were killed in the process. According to the Nigeria Railway Corporation, while 182 have safely been re reunited with their families, another 162 passengers are still missing. In health matters, the Presidential Steering Committee on COVID-19 has revealed the COVID-19 response in the country in view of the declining number of cases and the availability of vaccines. A statement issued from the Office of the Secretary to the Government of the Federation of States uh, states that the use of face masks remains mandatory for indoor activities while it is optional for outdoor activities. The statement also states that the nationwide curfew imposed from 12 midnight to 4 a.m. has been lifted. According to the statement, all civil servants are expected to return to work while adhering to the non-pharmaceutical intervention guidelines. All civil servants are expected to be fully vaccinated before accessing any government office. 
The statement takes into cognizance the political activities and urges political parties to take responsibility for compliance to safety measures during their meetings, either indoor or outdoors. The 50% limit on persons attending religious and social gatherings have also been lifted. Nigeria's foreign policy cannot be successfully advanced on the world stage if the country does not become an economic, political and military powerhouse domestically. This sums up the views of panelists at a book launch on foreign policy in Abuja, put together by the Deputy Minority Leader of the House of Representatives, Honorable Tobi Okechuku. Our correspondent, Dele Omoyeni, reports. The, the book Reflections on Nigeria's Foreign Policy, co-authored by the Deputy Minority Leader of the House of Representatives, Mr. Tobi Okechiku, is a compendium of the experiences of Nigeria's relationships with other parts of the world. And for the chairman of the occasion, Ambassador Aminu Wali, Nigeria deserves the permanent seat of Africa at the United Nations. We have not been successful in trying to push our position as a permanent member of the United Nations. And in Africa, no country deserves that position uh, other than Nigeria. But we're not being able to make it. Why? Because, yes, we may have our policy as Afrocentric, but at the same time, we're not getting the same uh, respect that we give to our neighbors or our police in Africa. The Speaker of the House of Representatives, Right Honorable Femi Gwajabiamila, pays tribute to the co-author and says foreign policy is selfish policy as every country advances what is in its best interest of who they are. Our nation's foreign policy defines the terms on which we engage with the rest of the world. It is through our foreign policy that we declare who we are, what we stand for, and the principles we hold dear and will defend as we have done here, at home, and abroad in South Africa, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and everywhere else we have been called upon. The co-author, Mr. Tobi Kichiku, expresses joy for the completion of the book and hopes that the book enriches the policy conversations in diplomatic circles. The nagging issue of Nigeria's shrinking voice in critical diplomatic circles may also be appreciated vis a -vis contemporary socioeconomic challenges at home. But then a robust tradition of diplomatic engagement will not only ameliorate this, but would also garner a reasonable level of image prestige. Again, this speaks to the integrity of institutions and the ability to withstand pressure. Foreign policies are agreed by participants to be an eternal contest for power and viability. Therefore, Nigeria must put its house in order to command the needed attention on the world stage in pursuit of its interests. Delia Moyeni, Channels Television News. Well, certainly a lot to mull over Amarache. That's all from Abuja. It's back to you. That's right, Maupe. And on to uh, business and news now uh, with Anne Mawodo. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Marachi. Hello and welcome to Business News. The International Energy Agency, IEA, says that it plans to release 120 million barrels of oil, and this is in a bid to ease global energy prices. According to the IEA, the United States will deploy 60 million barrels of oil, while the rest will come from other IEA member countries. The U.S. contribution is part of the 180 million barrels that President Joe Biden has already announced. The coordinate action by major energy consumers is intended to soften the economic fallout from a surge of energy prices since the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Economic sanctions and an official buyer strike have all curtailed Russian oil exports, 
resulting in the biggest energy supply disruption in decades. Meanwhile, oil prices fell following the IEA's announcement of big release from reserves. The chairman of the Nigeria Social Insurance Trust Fund, NSITF, Mr. Austin Esera, has been reacting to allegations by the House of Representatives at her committee on unclaimed funds that the NSITF owes the federal government 3.8 billion naira. He says that NSITF is solely a non-treasury funded organization with the primary duty of poverty alleviation and 1% contribution of employers made to NSITF. SITF and not revenue to the government. He was speaking with our business correspondent, Ladi Williams. There. But let me make this uh, a clarification. NSITF is a non treasury funded organization. And the funds we call that, that is described here is actually a 1% contribution coming from employers of labor to procure a cover, an insurance cover for employee. So it's not really a revenue. It is better described as a premium that is paid to procure a cover which ranges from total disability, permanent disability in case of accident, or medical claims or medical benefits that are, arises in the course of your working time. Otherwise, if a death occur, the mode of paying all this compensation are contained in the Employee Compensation Act 2010, very clearly. With gross earnings of 765.56 billion naira in the year 2021, Zenith Bank PLC believes it has recorded a performance that attests to its resilience, and this seems to be a confidence boost for the board. The financial institution's performance in the year 2021 was reviewed during its 31st annual general meeting in Lagos. This meeting was attended by management and staff, as well as shareholders of Zenith Bank. Shall we be seated? Board members, directors and shareholders of Zenith Bank PLC meet to receive and evaluate the bank's annual reports and financial statements for the year 2021. Now, business of the day. The proceedings highlight presentation of reports on the audited accounts from independent auditors, external consultants and audit committees of the bank. The scope and planning of the audit were adequate in our opinion. Figures from the review period indicate significant improvement across key indices. The group's gross earnings grew by 9.92% from 696.45 billion naira in 2020 to 765.56 billion naira in 2021. Profit after tax rose by 6.07% from 230.57 billion naira to 244.56 billion naira. In the midst of pandemic and economic challenges, we are able to grow our gross savings. Shareholders commend the board for its work, but they also our seek to understand the bank's decision to invest in areas like cybersecurity. We are at the forefront of driving digital awareness and illiteracy, because when you talk about cybercrime, it is a people thing. Either a people thing where you have a, 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 a collusion or you have a negligence where people don't know what to do. On the sidelines of the meeting, the group managing director gives further details on growth capabilities. When we started retail in 2018, number of accounts in the industry were like number eight. But as at the close of last year, Zenit is a very close number three in terms of number of accounts open. So you can see that the trend is continuing and we are going to continue to double down and accelerate our digital campaign. Shareholders are pleased about the dividend payout of 3 Naira Tenkobo for the 2021 financial year. As we were at the meeting, I got an alert uh, payment of the dividend. Uh, this is very commendable. Zenith Bank says it remains resolute to seek more growth opportunities while maintaining its overall goal 
of creating enduring value for all stakeholders. The equities market reversed gains recorded in yesterday's trading session. Investors are still continuing their profit-taking activity. All share index dipped marginally. In John Nikwa has the details. Oh, thank you so much. Welcome to the stock market report. Apparently, the marginal gain on the floor of the exchange yesterday was short-lived as the bear managed to take a swipe at the bull. Oh, the bear's weak grip did not greatly affect the performance of key sectors. As we see, the banking, oil and gas and insurance indexes, they closed in the green. UBA and First Bank contributed to the continued bounce in the banking sector. And that's despite the drop in Zenith Bank and GTCO. Subplot on the move again in today's trading session with 10 naira added to its share price. And that boosted the oil and gas counter by 0.2%. Insurance index was up almost half a percentage today, and that's thanks to Regency Alliance Insurance, which edged up 10% to emerge top gainer, while MPF Microfinance Bank led 17 other decliners. Now, despite the negative sentiments in the market, the total turnover saw a boost when compared to yesterday's transactions, a sign of increased sell-off by market players. And once again, Fidelity leads the top trade by volume. Almost 82 million units of shares were transacted today. Now, should we hope for a glimmer of hope or not? We'll find out tomorrow. That's a stock market report. I'm Ini John Mekwa. Thank you, Ini. Let's find out how other major markets ended the day session. That's business news tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Anne Mwawadu. It's back to you, Marachi. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Thanks a lot, Anne. And former President Goodluck Jonathan has expressed sadness over the death of two police officers attached to him. The officers, Inspectors Ibrahim Abazi and Yakubu Toma, were in the convoy of the ex-president when the fleet of cars was involved in a crash today around the Namdi Azikiwe International Airport, Abuja. In a statement by his media aide, Ikechuku Eze, the former president paid tribute to the officers, saying they were dedicated to their duties and service to the nation. Beyond our shores now, head of the Kharkiv Regional Administration, Ole Sanyubov, said has said on social media it will not be carrying out any centralized evacuation measures in Kharkiv despite warnings from Ukraine's Deputy Prime Minister Irina Vershuk that people in eastern Ukraine evacuate while it is still possible. In a post on Telegram, Ole said, we know that the enemy hasn't changed its plans, but we believe in our Ukrainian armed forces and the strength of our defenses. He said two towns close to the Donetsk region, Bravin Kov and Lozovy should be evacuated. Simon Pusey has more on Ukraine and around the world in five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. Thousands of people are fleeing Ukraine's Donbass region as Russia shifts the focus of its attacks to the east of the country. And as Russian forces withdraw further from towns around the capital, the scale of death and destruction is becoming clearer. Here, a man mourning the death of his closest childhood friend, who disappeared when Russian troops occupied the town of Butcher. Burnt-out tanks and debris cover every inch of this town, and there are many more like it. We all saw the gruesome pictures. From International Russia. condemnation of Russia continues to pour in for the atrocities that appear to have happened here. The Kremlin denies any Russian involvement. With Russia, we have to cut ties. In an impassioned plea in the Irish Parliament, President Zelensky asked lawmakers to show more leadership. 
Meanwhile, NATO foreign ministers are meeting for two days of talks on how to best support Ukraine. So fast. But I'm afraid when you look at what's happening in, uh, in Bucha, the, 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 the revelations that we're seeing from uh, what Putin has done in, in Ukraine, which, you know, doesn't look far short of genocide uh, to me, it is no wonder that people are responding in the way that they are. Pope Francis has condemned what he called the massacre of Bucha and held up a blue and yellow Ukrainian flag that was sent to him from the town. Viene dalla guerra. This flag comes from the war, from the martyred city Bucha, Pope Francis said, holding up the flag for an audience of several thousand, which broke into applause. The flag looked darkened and stained and had writing on it. He then invited some Ukrainian children who escaped from the war on stage next to him. Sri Lanka's beleaguered president will not be resigning, his government's whip has said. This is the time that they can uh, come out. The declaration defies calls from the public and political opponents for Gotabaya Rajapaska to step down amid the country's economic crisis. Crowds have protested for weeks over lengthy power cuts and shortages of gas, food and other basic goods. The public anger has prompted nearly all cabinet ministers to quit and scores of MPs to leave his government. Opposition MPs have also rejected his invite to form a national unity government, saying voters want the president and the entire government to resign. Public transport has largely ground to a halt in the Greek capital as workers walked out of their jobs in a 24-hour general strike to protest rising prices. The strike left ferries to and from Greek islands tied up in port and left Athens without a subway, tram, trolley or suburban railway. State-run hospitals were treating emergency cases only as healthcare workers joined the strike. Public and private sector workers are demanding salary increases and measures to tackle rising prices. More than 10,000 people marched through central Athens in two demonstrations and about 9,000 protesters held marches in Greece's second largest city. Fresh fighting has broken out in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo days after rebels had declared a unilateral ceasefire to make way for talks with the government. In the last few days, around 6,000 refugees who had returned home have fled back to neighbouring Uganda. Sources say government forces are fighting to retake villages in Ruchuru area in North Kivu province that are currently occupied by the M23 rebels. Regional leaders were expected to meet this week over negotiations between the government and rebels. A 5.1 magnitude earthquake has hit the southwest China's Sichuan province. The quake struck Xingwen County of Yibin City at around 7.50 on Wednesday Beijing time. The epicenter was monitored at a depth of 10 kilometers. That's according to the China Earthquake Network Center. CCTV showed people running for cover as the tremors were felt. Authorities say so far there have been no reports of any casualties. And the singer Ed Sheeran has won a high court copyright battle over his 2017 hit song, Shape of You. A judge ruled that the singer-songwriter had not plagiarised the 2015 song Oh Why by Sammy Chokri, a grime artist who performs under the name Sammy Switch, had claimed the OI hook in Sheeran's track was strikingly similar to an OY refrain in his own track. Sheeran said he did not remember hearing OY before the legal case. Shape of You was the UK's best-selling song of 2017 in the UK and is Spotify's most stream song ever. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios. Welcome to Sports News. We begin with midweek marches in the Nigeria Professional Football League. Abia Warriors recorded a 2-1 win over Aimba in their Abia Derby clash earlier this evening. Dakada is the, uh, their relegation warriors courtesy of a 2-0 win against Quara United. And in the Women's League, March Day Games produced 11 goals across the country. Defending champions Rivers Angels urged uh, Bayelsa Queens 1-0 to win the Old Creek Derby played in Port Harcourt. And in the uh, UCL, Karim Benzema's hat streak fired uh, Real Madrid to a stunning 3-1 win over Chelsea. That put the Champions League holders on the brink of elimination after a dramatic quarter-final first leg. Benzema produced a masterclass at Stanford Bridge as the French striker netted twice in the first half with two perfectly taken headers. Kai Havertz reduced the deficit before the interval. 
But Benzema punished a woeful mistake from Chelsea keeper Eduardo Mendy in the second half to complete his treble. And uh, Villarreal inflicted a shocking 1-0 victory over Bayern Munich as um, Danjuma's uh, a dangerous strike boosted the Spanish team's hope of causing a huge upset in the Champions League quarterfinals. And that sports news is back to you, Marichi. Thanks, Chris. And the main news again. The Federal High Court in Abuja today ordered governments to implement a 35% affirmative action on women participation in government. The court accused past governments of acting in breach of international treaties on women involvement in government. That's it on the news at 10 tonight. Thanks for watching. I'm Amarachi Ubani. Good night.